We just thank God for another Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, God is awesome. And uh, today I just want to talk a little bit about a situation that was in the Bible, Acts chapter 16. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And uh, it centers around Paul and Silas when they were in prison. And uh, just what I want to talk about today is how do we deal with adversity? Acts chapter 16. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the verse in a minute. Acts chapter 16. We want to talk about how do we get through adversity? How do we deal with hard times? How, we, how do we deal with pain? How do we deal with suffering? And pain and suffering is something that every Christian is going to encounter at some point in your life. There's no way you're going to not uh, go through some period of pain or suffering in your life. The Bible says the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. In fact, there's a whole Bible devoted to a man named Job that did nothing to deserve what he got, but yet he suffered probably more than anybody this side of Jesus. So God wants us to understand something, and there's going to be times when we're going to have to endure hard times. We're going to have to endure suffering. But Paul and Silas teaches us how to go through it. And sometimes when we're studying this story, we not only learn how to go through it, we also sometimes learn why we go through it. <clears throat> but I want to start off in chapter 15. Just follow along with me. I'm going to read chapter 15, verse 39 and 40. And it says, And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, Cilicia strengthening, strengthening the churches. So before we get to the meat of the story, I just want to go back a little bit just to help you understand the position that Paul and Silas were in. Now, when Paul first started his ministry, he didn't start off partnering with Silas. He started off partnering with a man named Barnabas. And Barnabas was sort of like Paul's mentor. Barnabas was like Paul's uh, trainer, so to speak. You know, before Paul became this famous apostle, he started off after he was on the road to Damascus and he lost his eyesight and he went blind and God gave him the commission to be an apostle and to do the work. But like everybody, it's something we fail to realize sometimes is everybody has to be taught. Everybody has to be mentored. And so Barnabas initially was mentored or mentored Paul. And if you look early in the book, in the book of Acts, when it, when it starts off, it, it says Barnabas and Saul, and then it elevated to Paul and Barnabas, and then because of this division that they had, Paul partnered up with Silas. And I read this for a reason, because what I want us to understand is this. Just because you're saying doesn't mean you're not going to have disagreements. Paul was probably the mightiest of all the apostles, but yet there was division in the church. There was division between Paul and Barnabas over on a, on a disciple named Mark. And what happened was Paul was getting ready to go on a missionary journey and Mark uh, decided at the last minute he wasn't going. So that really, that really uh, uh, upset Paul. Paul was like, you know, I can't trust this kid to go on another trip when he didn't show up for the last one. So Barnabas, who was related to Mark, took Mark and they went to Cyprus and Paul went with Silas and they went another direction. They went into Greece. So th this is kind of the beginning of their journey, but I wanted to read this for a reason because in verse 41 it says, and he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And that was Paul's primary ministry when he was traveling. He was, it was to strengthen the churches. Because back in those days, churches went through a lot. They went through a lot because they were persecuted. You know, you could get locked up and thrown in jail just for mentioning the name of Jesus. You know, you could get locked up or thrown in jail just for, you know, trying to witness or tell somebody about the Lord. So there were a lot of widows back in those days. There were widows because a lot of the men got killed for the sake of Christ. And that's one of the reasons why when you read in the book of James, uh, that James gives the, 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 the edict or the command to the church to, that true religion is to visit the widows and the fatherless because there were so many children without fathers, so many women without husbands because these men were killed doing the work of the Lord. 
So this is this give you a background of what's going on here. So in chapter 16, verse 9, it says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so as we can see, Paul doesn't do anything without getting the direction from God. And that's something we need to learn how to do, saints. We need to learn to be prayerful so we get direction from God. And not just direction for what we do in church, but direction for everything we do in life. You know, some of the decisions that we made that were bad decisions, we probably wouldn't have made them when we sought direction from God before we made the decision. And Lord knows I made a lot of bad decisions in my life. But I know I look backwards and when those times when I prayed and sought God's face, I didn't make the bad decisions. But one thing about God is when God gives you a direction to do something, it isn't always going to turn out pleasant. And that's something we need to understand about God. Sometimes God will tell you to go somewhere and it may not be pleasant. God may tell you to go do something and it may not be uh, gratifying. It may not be uh, something that makes you feel good. Because one of the things we have to understand about our, our walk with God is our walk with God is synonymous with the walk of Christ. And our walk with God is just like the walk of Christ. You know, the Bible lets us know that, you know, that we should suffer likewise. Just like Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer. Just like Jesus endured hard times, we're going to go through hard times. Just like Jesus was rejected, we're going to be rejected. But the thing we have to remember, saints, is it is the hard part for us because we're human. Don't take it personally. Do y'all hear what I said? Don't take it personally. Good example. Yesterday we were out handing out flyers and tracts and Bibles. And I say 99% of the people that we handed stuff to, they took it, smiled. We even got to pray with a couple people. But there was one man I gave a tract to. He looked at it, and he had this angry look in his face. And he looked at me, he gritted his teeth, balled it up, threw it in the trash. I didn't take it personally. I just said, God bless you. Go in peace. And I kept on, see, because what the devil does is, remember the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't take it personally, because it ain't about you. He didn't reject Mark Stevens. He rejected the gospel. So I don't take it personally. Something else you got to remember, too, is when you're doing ministry, everybody that may reject you on Thursday, they may come back to you on Friday and say, could you pray for me? And that's one of the main reasons why you can't take it personally, because you have to look at every individual human being like a child of God, like a human being that needs help. They may reject, they may reject the message. You keep praying for them. They may reject church. Keep praying for them. I'm going to tell you something else. A lot of people reject church because they've been hurt in church. You can say amen, it's the truth. You know, but what I try to encourage people is this. You may have gotten hurt in church, but have you given up on Jesus? Don't give up on Jesus, because Jesus didn't give up on you. See, when I was running out in the street and drinking and doing drugs and, and partying, I gave up on Jesus, but Jesus didn't give up on me. And that's what we have to understand. You know, Jesus never leaves us, we leave him. But he's always standing there waiting for us like this. Like the prodigal son's father, he's always standing there waiting. So don't ever forget that. So back to Paul and Silas. So Paul gets this vision from God, and he's, he goes to Macedonia. So let's look at uh, verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now this is what we have to understand is, when somebody gets saved, they don't get saved because of you. They get saved because God opens their heart. Our job is to give them the message of Jesus Christ. But it's God's job to open up people's hearts. That's why you can never take this stuff personally. I've had people, I'll never forget, I, I was witnessing to somebody overseas one time and, and, and yeah, when we were giving out bread and giving out tracks, little kid threw the bread in my face. 
And so the lady that was a, a Turkish lady, she looked at me and she said, oh, that was so disrespectful. And she apologized. I said, no problem. And I just kept on walking. Now, what if I had got angry and slammed the bread on the ground and went to grab the little kid in his collar? Because my flesh felt like doing that. But when you're doing the work of ministry, you have to remember, you're dealing with souls. You're not dealing with, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So as Paul's ministering, he's preaching, this woman named Lydia said, the Lord opened her heart. The only reason why we get saved is because God opens our heart to understand what was preached to us. Don't ever take credit for your salvation because you can't take credit for it. We're saved by grace through faith. Notice it says grace first, not faith through grace, grace. Because in order for us to apply the faith, we had to receive the grace. You're saved only because of God's grace. You're saved only because God loved you enough to send his son to die on a cross. You're not saved because you was raised Kojic. You're not saved because your daddy was a Baptist preacher. You're not saved because you wore a suit and tie. You're not saved because you wore a long skirt and a doily. You're saved because of grace. Can I get an amen? Amen. You're saved because of grace. So, this woman, her heart was opened by God, and she received the Lord. Verse 15, and when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. And this is a good example of how God takes care of his people. See, Paul and Silas were missionaries. They were apostles, but they didn't have a gold card. They didn't have a car. They didn't have a truck. They didn't have a vehicle. They pretty much walked and rode boats anywhere they went. There was no hotel for them to stay in, but God would provide for them. So as this lady got saved, God laid in her heart to say, look, you can stay with us. Now, the good, see how good God is? It gives her occupation before she got saved. It says she was a seller of purple. Now, let me explain what that means. She sold material. But the fact that she was a seller of purple meant that she sold good material. It was the kind of material that the Roman soldiers and the kings and the princes used. So this wasn't a poor lady. But the Lord laid on her heart to be a blessing to the work of Paul and Silas. And this is, goes to show you, when you're doing God's work, you ain't got to worry about how, how you're going to get taken care of. God's going to take care of you. But do his work. Do his work. God will take care of you. Amen? Verse 16. It happened that as they were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very moment. Now I'll stop right there for a second. Now initially you might say, okay, what this demonically inspired little girl was saying was true. They were servants of God. They were preaching the gospel. But why was it a problem for her to say that? It was a problem because back then you had to do ministry undercover. Because if they walked down the street with a big banner saying, you know, Jesus is Lord, then they got thrown in jail or cut their heads cut off. So what she was basically doing was putting them on blast and to get them in trouble. So Paul got annoyed. He called, called that demon out. Demon, come out in the name of Jesus. The girl was delivered. But because of that, the people that owned her had Paul beaten and Silas beaten and arrested and thrown in jail. Thrown in jail. And you say, well, wait a minute, weren't they doing God's will? Yeah. Yeah, you can do God's will and still get attacked. You can do God's will and still suffer. It goes, with the, it goes along with the program. But that's why Jesus says to his disciples, if you're going to follow me, you got to be willing to take up your own cross. And at, at the time, they didn't understand it. But I'm sure after the resurrection, they understood it. Yeah, we have to take up our own cross, meaning there's going to be times where because you're a Christian, you're going to suffer. Because you preach the gospel, you're going to suffer. Because you stand for the truth, you're going to suffer. And that's why Peter wrote this in his epistle. 
Think it not strange the fiery trial that come upon you. Don't, don't, no, oh my God, I got fired for saying Jesus. Think it not strange. I lost a promotion because I stood up for righteousness. Oh, think it not strange. But this is something we're going to see. All right. Verse 22. The crowd rose up together against them. And the chief magistrates tore off their robe, tore their robes off them, and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. Now I'm gonna stop right there. One of the punishments that the Roman soldiers used to uh, inflict, beside beating people with stripes, was beating people with rods. And what they did was they would hang you upside down by your ankles, lower you and somebody would beat the bottom of your feet with rods. Normally, that beating of the bottom of the feet caused most of your bones in your feet to be broken. That was the punishment that Paul and Silas got for casting the devil out of that little girl. They were beaten with rods. Verse 23, when they had struck them with many blows, it wasn't a few blows, many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, what that meant was this. They were in the inner prison, which was the deepest part of the prison. Now, back in those days, prison wasn't like prison today. I used to be a correction officer and I was a chaplain at Riverfront Prison, so I can tell you, prison today is a lot different than prison back in them days. Prison today, they got cable TV and they get three hot meals and they got a bed to sleep in. Back then when you were in prison, you laid on straw, there was no bathroom, you, where you slept, you pooped, where you slept, you peed. There was no entertainment. There was no special visitors. There was no conjugal visits. There was no none of that in prison back in them days. So not only did he get beaten with rods, but they got thrown into the nastiest part of the prison and said their feet were put in stocks, meaning that their hands, they sat on their behind, their hands and their feet were stuck out, their hands were stuck out, and their feet and their ankles were attached. Sometimes with chains, sometimes, and back during the pilgrim days, when they put you in stocks, it was like a wooden board, and they put your feet in with two sets of holes, and they put your hands in another set of holes. All right, so I want you to imagine something. They just beat your feet all night, broke your feet, now they stick these same feet in some chains attached to your wrist. Think about that. So verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I want you to think about this. They got the bottom of their feet beat. It said many times. So imagine their broken feet are in these stocks. They also whipped them because it was also a Roman custom to whip people, flagellate people also. So their backs were ripped open, the bottom of their feet were broken, and they were in stocks. Their ankles and their wrists were attached. But it said at midnight, which is the darkest hour of the day, it said they prayed and sang praises to God. I want you to marinate on that for a minute. How many of you in here are going through something? Everybody can raise their hand. We all going through something. Amen. It ain't a shame. Ain't a shame. We all going through something. Every last one of us. What I'm going through, you might not be going through. What you're going through, we might not be going through, but we're all going through something. We all got maybe a physical I I issue, a, a financial issue, a housing issue, a family issue. But we're all going through something. But none of us are going through what these brothers went through right here. I want you to think about that. Sometimes my work as a chaplain, I go to work, I might not be feeling good. I, I don't feel good most days. I got sarcoidosis, lymphedema, you know, got migraine, headaches, eyes hurt, blind in one eye, other eye ain't doing too good. But I'll go to work and I'll see somebody 
with stage four cancer. Or I'll see somebody that lost their mind. Or I'll see somebody that's, that's dying of tuberculosis. Or I'll see somebody that just got their legs cut off. And I just looked up my hands. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, all of us are going through something. All of us are going through something. That's why I, I try my best not to judge people because what you're going through, I might not be able to survive it. And what I'm going through, you might not be able to deal with it. But we're all going through something. But the way you deal with it is through prayer and through praise. You might not see your next meal. You might not see how your bill's gonna get paid. You might not see how your car's gonna run. You might not see your way through your next crisis, but pray. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. See, I, I, I'm gonna stop right there before I get into the praise part. <clears throat> the Bible also says that is anything too hard for God? See, I've gotten to the place in my life where I'm stupid enough to believe God for anything. And I'm also stupid enough to believe that if it don't come the way I want it, he's going to come some way. Because see, sometimes when you ask God for help, the help doesn't come the way you think it's going to come. You know, you might need money and God will send you something else. Or you might need a job and God will send you this or God will send you But however it comes, God's going to do it because this is something we have to understand about God. God is omniscient. What omniscient means is he knows everything. And sometimes the job you think you might need, God might say, well, you can take that job, you're going to backslide. Or if you take this job, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna find your way away from your family. See, God knows everything. You know, and I look at how God works. Then in my life, you know, I've always been this type of person. When I, when I apply for a job or, or when I'm trying to get ahead, I try to make sure I got every qualification filled. You know, I try to make sure that, you know, whatever training I got to get, whatever I got to do, I try to get it. Whatever certification, I try to get it. And with that in mind, I've seen people that had less training, less education, less certification get jobs in front of me. And I got some kind of attitude about them. I'm like, okay, Lord, what, what's up with that? You know? I got three degrees and somebody with a high school diploma just got this job. You know, and I got an attitude. But I learned something. When you're going through something, the biggest hindrance to us getting through it is our attitude. See, because your attitude blocks blessings. See, when you look at what they got instead of looking at what he has, you're not focused on him, you're focused on them. That's why jealousy and envy is such a dangerous, dangerous sin. Because when you start looking at, well, they got this and I ain't got that, you got God. Well, they got this and I ain't got that, you got the Lord. There's no, there's no recession in heaven. There's no lack in the kingdom of God. Talk to God. I'm going to tell you something, saints. I look back over my life, especially since I've been married, my wife and I, you know, we, we, we serve God, we do the ministry, we give, we, we're always, uh, uh, you know, and there's times when we lack stuff, but I've seen God come to the Stevens rescue more than one time, where all of a sudden we got it this way, it didn't come that way, but it came this way, or it came another way, or God came this way, you know, God is good. But when you take your focus off him and start looking at the, your feelings, your feelings will fool you. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. That's why I learned a long time ago, I don't get excited by my feelings. Now I know as Pentecostal folks, we like a feeling. You know, we like to come in church and get the, 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 get a feeling and cold chills run and, you know, blown bubbles and, you know, whatever. But there's gonna be times you ain't gonna feel nothing. We walk by faith and not by sight. You can't go by feelings, feelings will fool you. Yeah. You know, feelings almost got me in trouble, you know, back when I was 19 years old, I was marrying this girl with a drug problem. My feelings like, she fine. That was my feelings. That, one, that almost, got, almost got me in trouble. 
You can't go by your feelings. You got to go by the cold, hard facts. And the facts are the word of God is the truth. And you got to stand on that truth. You can't go by your feelings. If Paul and Silas went by, let me share something else with you about Paul and Silas. Then we're going to get to the meat. Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. What they did to them was wrong. You're not supposed to arrest a Roman citizen without a trial. So while they were in this prison, back torn up, ankles and feet broken, in pain, sitting in feces and urine, infection, all kinds of filth, Paul is start screaming and hollering, hey, 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 I'm a Roman citizen. I know my rights. It said they just prayed and sang praises to God. So what did God do? It said the prisoners were listening to them. See, when you're going through, people are listening to you. If you're a saved, sanctified, spirit-filled Christian, and all people hear out of you is whining and complaining, that ain't no testimony to God. That ain't no testimony. I'm going to tell you something, saints. There's days when I go to work, my, my pain level is so bad, I don't want to walk. And people will look at me and say, how you feeling today? I say, I'm just fine. I'm doing good. And I'm not. But I cry to him. And that's what we have to learn how to do. When you're going through, give the tears to him. Yes. Give the pain to him. Pray and talk to him. Yes. Give, out, give everything to him. But don't let anybody else see you sweat. My wife always reminds me of that. And I thank God because she does. Because there are times when I, don't, I want to go off. And she said, don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them see you sweat. Because the devil wants to see you sweat. The devil wants you to get beside yourself. The devil wants you to get your little feelings hurt. And then when your little feelings hurt, you walk around like this, like, you know, all, all sore, butt sore, everything. You know, God, God, the people are watching you. Well, she says she's saved and sanctified and filled, and all she do is complain. All she do is whine about how she didn't get this promotion, whine about how she didn't get this, and whine because they moved her desk over here. Christians should be the last people in the world to whine. We should. We should. Did you hear Jesus whining on the cross? No. Now he had some complaints, he had some pain, but he did it, he went through it. Paul and Silas here in the jail, they're going through it. Verse 26, and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. See, God wants to shake the foundation of your trouble. But he can't if you're whining and complaining. God wants to shake the foundation of your situation. But he can't if you're not looking at him and you're looking at everybody else. Look to the hills. For whence cometh your what? Help. Your help comes from where? The Lord. Let me say this to you. And this is a hard one for us saved folks to get. Sometimes when you're going through a situation, you might think the first person that God just should help you is another Christian. How many of you have gone to Christians and they weren't able to help you? Oh yeah, and it's not always because they don't want to. Maybe they're going through something and they can't help you. You know, but the hitting is where we get you know, sore and, and, and hurt. Well, the saints didn't help me. Ask God for help. The help will come. I remember when I get, got back from Desert Storm, my wife and I, the Lord bless us, be able to buy a house. And when it was time for us to move, we didn't have a whole lot of money because I was a correction officer at the time and we weren't making a whole lot of money. I wasn't a civil service at the time. I was a tech sergeant in the reserves. They messed up my pay overseas and somehow they, that got screwed up and I was hurting for cash. But the Lord still blessed us to be able to get a house. But we didn't have a truck. We didn't have any help. I, I asked some of the saints for help. Everybody was busy. And, and I started getting a little butt hurt. I was a little upset. I started saying, well, Lord, we know I, I, help, I help that one and they can't help me. And Lord, I help that one and they can't help me. And, if, and I'll never forget this. The Lord, I was standing outside of the apartments where we live. And the Lord said, did you ask me to help you? And I started crying. And I said, okay. Went to work that day. As soon as I walked in the door, 
one of my old load master friends named Joe Fiordaliso. He said, I heard you was moving. He said, you need any help? I said, I just need a truck. And Joe had the biggest pickup truck in the unit. He said, all I want you to do is fill the tank when you return into my house. And not only did he give me a truck, he had a trailer on the back of the truck. And then as I'm walking to my desk, another one of my friends who I was in active duty with said, you need help moving? He wasn't even saved. Neither one of these guys were Christians. Stop worrying about how God gets you the blessing and just know that God's going to send you the blessing. But the other thing I had to do was I, had, I couldn't hold a grudge against the people that said no. Because it ain't about them. It's about you and your faith and your relationship with Jesus Christ. All right? The help's going to come. Just, just wait on it. Just wait. All right. So here, God shook up the prison. Doors open. Here's the prison guard. He takes out his sword. He's going to kill himself. He said, why are you going to kill himself? Because jail was different back then. I used to be a correction officer. We had folks that tried to escape. But when they escaped, they didn't, I, they didn't kill me. But back then, if you were a prisoner, if you were a, a prison guard, and somebody escaped on your watch, they either killed you or you served out their sentence. Because somebody was going to pay. So when, he, when this guy saw the doors all open, he took out his sword and going to kill himself. Paul said, do yourself no harm. We're all here. Now, I want you to think about this. This is, gonna, this is when we get into where the rubber meets the road. Paul and Silas could have very easily crawled out of there and never looked back. But they said, do thyself no harm. We're all here. I'm going to tell you why Paul did that. Because Paul realized through the omniscience and greatness of God that his reason for being in that prison was because of that one prison guard. Sometimes God puts you in a tight situation because he's putting you there so you can help somebody. It wasn't about Paul and Silas, but it was about this prison guard. And the man said, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your household shall be saved. The man took Paul and Silas back to his crib, fed them, washed them up, cleaned up their wounds, bound up their feet. Then the Romans realized that they did Paul and Silas wrong. So he wasn't going to have to go back to prison anyway. But I want you to think about the character of Paul and Silas. They refused to leave that prison until that man was safe and until he was saved. Sometimes God has us in places and we don't know why we're there, but it's because God wants you to help somebody get saved. I want you to think about this because it ain't always about us. There have been times in my life where I had to do things and go places like, God, I don't want to do this. But there was a reason. There was a reason. I just got married to my wife and five months after I got married, I'm getting activated for Desert Storm. I ain't feel like leaving my wife. I just got married. And first they said,